Hey everyone, welcome back to Here in Apologetics. I'm so pumped you're joining us today to have Justin Brierly joining me today to talk about his new book, The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, published by Tindo House. Um, Justin's been working in radio, podcasting, and video for over two decades. Um, he co-hosts the Reenchanting Podcast for Seen and Unseen, is a well-known speaker and broadcaster. He also founded the popular Unbelievable Faith Debate Show and hosts the Ask NT Write Anything podcast. Um, if you listen to this show, I'm sure you know who Justin is. Uh, so I'm excited for today. One thing before we get going, uh, if you are just joining us, I'd encourage you to like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And if you value what we do, uh, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. Our goal is we're trying to get one new patron a month, so we could be updated on social media. And if you could do that, that'd be huge. But Justin... Welcome. How are you today? I'm very well. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Zach. It's great to be with you. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about this book, um, The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, because it's interesting because it's something that like I've seen just like listening to like podcasts and like just following like the way the debate's gone the past few like um, years. So tell us a little bit about like who you are, what you do and what kind of got you interested in like this project, Justin. Well, I've been in the space of doing conversations around apologetics and faith for a, a long, long time. So I founded The Unbelievable Show about 17 years ago, and that's been bringing people together for dialogue and debate for many, many years um, from, you know, Christians, atheists, agnostics, people of other faiths. Um, I actually moved on from that show just recently, but it gave me a great foundation for hosting conversations about the, you know, why Christianity makes sense and uh, that's given me a ringside seat, I suppose, to the changing nature of the conversation in our culture. So the show was kind of founded around the time that the new atheism was really getting up to speed. Um, shortly after I launched the show, Richard Dawkins published The God Delusion. And for, for many years, you know, we were focusing on that aspect of the debate, the new atheists, that very um, militaristic almost response to Christianity. But then I noticed in the last few years um, of hosting these conversations that the, the the temperature of the conversations was changing. Um, people were less and less willing to side or to associate themselves with the new atheism. And there was a lot of new conversations going on by secular thinkers <clears throat> like Jordan Peterson, Tom Holland, Douglas Murray and others, who I felt were reevaluating whether we can live without Christianity in the West. Um, I think they they saw the new atheists as having thrown the baby out with the bathwater uh, and even though they're not believers, they were asking significant questions about Christianity. So this is a book, really, th this new book about tracing that that change in the way that the culture is talking about these questions and why I think actually we could be due for a rebirth of belief in God in our generation. Mm. This is super interesting, Justin, and I think it's valuable with your experience. Like you talked about hosting like unbelievable. Like I remember some, listening to some of those like way back, like I wasn't really in apologetics when you first like started doing these episodes, but going back to like 2007, eight, nine, 10, where the conversations and what would happen, like even on this podcast is you've had like a front row seat are very different than the conversations you've been having with like Jordan Peterson, mm. Douglas Murray. And it's amazing to see this shift. Um, so I think it's cool that you've kind of had a front line. Yeah. It's, all it's, this. it's been an absolute privilege, you know, to, to be there and to see that happening. And um, I would say that when I, what what it means is that those conversations are quite different because I guess the classic kind of unbelievable shows uh, of yesteryear were, were those full on God debates, you know, between someone like a, a William Lane Craig and, you know, a Lawrence Krauss or whoever. Um, these the conversations that you have, though, between, say, Jordan Peterson and someone else are, are a very, very different nature because Jordan Peterson, you know, when he came on my show, he he was almost like a Christian apologist himself. He was so eager to defend the way in which the Judeo-Christian worldview has contributed to and established our sense of who we are and human rights and that kind of thing. So it's it's a very different kind of conversation. A lot, in some ways, these new thinkers are a lot more sympathetic to the Christian worldview because I think they see the dangers of abandoning it and they actually see a lot of danger in kind of going down the route of embracing a very secular materialist kind of worldview because I think they see that it's done a lot of damage actually to our to our culture. So those those are very interesting conversations to have. So what do you think is like what led you to start investigating like this trend of like these thinkers? Um, because you talked about these people that are seeing the dangers of like this materialistic worldview, looking at where we're at in like 2015 and like, ooh, that's there's some rough things here. Um, what led you to get like really interested in this topic, Justin? <laughs> 
I I think because I've just always had an interest in in where these conversations are going, I, I was really interested to see the way that increasingly, you know, when I approached people to have conversations on the show, they would be saying something along the lines of, well, I'm an atheist, but I'm not a Richard Dawkins kind of atheist. And, and I realized to some extent, the new atheism, um, just as quickly as it emerged, kind of splintered and fragmented and ultimately imploded. Uh, so I spent the first chapter of the book actually talking about that, because I think there's there's a really interesting story to be told there of the way in which the new atheism itself kind of came to, to, to kind of, yeah, just, well, once they'd agreed that God didn't exist, they just couldn't agree on anything else, basically. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it split into all these warring factions, some of whom went off on a kind of very um, kind of free thinking, libertarian kind of we need to rally against political correctness kind of vibe and others who went down the very kind of social justice warrior vibe. And those two were very much kind of almost at polar opposites of the 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 cultural spectrum. So it was just interesting to see that the new atheism itself, you know, kind of broke apart. Um, for all kinds of reasons during that time. And then to see some of these interesting new thinkers who were asking, well, can we live without Christian faith? Uh, I, I guess I was I was intrigued that um, there were secular people willing to stand up, often with big platforms, and willing to say, have you thought about looking at the Bible again? Because I'm not sure we've got a better guide for life than that. You know, the obvious example of someone doing that was Jordan Peterson, He's, he's obviously um, a polarizing character himself in many ways, but it's it's very interesting to see the way that nowadays far more young people, young men especially, flock to him than you would see generally flocking to, you know, someone like Richard Dawkins and so on. Hmm. So it's really like this culture divide where you have like secular thinkers um, that when you get outside of like the, their view of God have like these very like different views. Like you talk about like Dawkins or Peterson or you could throw in like Sam Harris. Like once you get outside of like, well, God doesn't exist and like they have very different views of things. And that for you is kind of what got you interested in, in, in thinking about this. Yeah. And, and the fact that once you've simply said God doesn't exist, you do have to then work out how to live your life. Um, and to that extent, the Christian story has been incredibly influential and i think increasingly mm. i've seen secular people kind of admitting that you can't simply build a worldview up um out of nothing um you sort of have to have something to stand on and even if they don't believe in christianity increasingly people are more and more willing to admit that uh, the judeo-christian heritage of the west is basically responsible for everything they hold dear I mean, a good example of this is is Tom Holland, who I've had on my show a number of times, not not the Spider-Man actor, but the historian Tom Holland. Uh, mm -hmm. He wrote a kind of magisterial book called Dominion, which really laid out the way in which the Christian revolution 2000 years ago has shaped everything we take for granted about our moral instincts in the West today, equality, human rights, dignity and so on. And he he you know, he discovered this as a non-Christian himself, someone who's, you know, a kind of vague childhood faith had fizzled out really by his teenage years. And in the conversations I've had with him, it's just becomes apparent that actually once you sort of any, well, a lot of secular people who are actually thinking about it are wondering what do we base our society on in the absence of the Christian story? Because so many people I think are now coming to realize that um, it it was doing a lot of heavy lifting actually and once you decide god doesn't exist and christianity is not true you've still got the question of well what do we replace it with because mm. at the moment the atheist materialist account of reality doesn't seem to be actually answering any of people's deepest questions or longings or creating a kind of flourishing culture um and and so i think that's 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 the big question that we need to address mm. so what like you've talked a lot about like new atheism like what is new the new atheism and like why do you think it's like like failing to provide these satisfactory answers? Well, new atheism was this very dogmatic, quite shrill, almost fundamentalist form of atheism that came to dominate the airwaves in the mid 2000s. To some extent, it was a response to things like 9-11 and um, certain people, you know, trying to teach um, intelligent design in classrooms and that kind of thing. So it came out sort of very much as a movement um claiming to be scientific in nature um it was very much all about taking darwin and 
using science, reason and rationality to sort of overcome the forces of superstition and ignorance that they believed religion represented. As I say, Richard Dawkins was probably the standard bearer of the movement with books like The God Delusion. But typically people say there were four horsemen of the new atheism. Richard Dawkins, um, Christopher Hitchens, who's now died, but he was a well-known journalist and uh, just an excellent speaker. Um, Daniel Dennett, who's a philosopher, and Sam Harris, who again is a public communicator on issues of uh, neuroscience and culture generally. So, so these were the, the standard bearers of the new atheism. And for a while, they rode high in the bestseller charts with their books. Um, there were lots and lots of kind of new atheist style conferences going on all over the world, especially in the USA. And, and it became a real kind of cultural phenomenon. But as I say, um, having made a lot of noise and potentially made some converts as well to their cause, uh, it did it did suddenly sputter out quite dramatically once um, they started to fall out with each other. So towards the end of the time that the new atheism was at its height, um, there just began to be all kinds of factions and ructions, um, people falling out with each other to the extent that they would no longer attend the same conferences because they hold, held different views on what they should be campaigning for. Were they, you know, atheism plus, which essentially meant, you know, atheism plus uh, lots of other ideologies, feminism, race, LGBT, and so on. Uh, or were they just, you know, these free thinkers who were allowed to say and do and think what they wanted? And uh, and so it was it was just very interesting to see that that movement really came to a grinding halt. And, you know, one of its chief architects, PZ Myers, who I had on my show a few times over the years, he he kind of went on the more kind of progressive end of the spectrum. And he came to say afterwards that, being a sort of standard bearer of that movement was one of the deepest regrets of his life because he saw it as, mm. as just having become so destructive and in his view right wing but um but yeah it, it that was kind of what it was and uh, as i say i think it's still its effects are still felt it still had a lot of influence in the culture it's not as though the thinking has gone away altogether but having said that it, it does feel like a a, a movement now that's in the back window and so i was just really interested in in seeing what's now come to replace that movement mm -hmm. it's almost like and you've kind of suggested this justin like when i think about it like this new atheist movement is very good at asking questions um like you think about like people like you'd listen to that you might even fall kind of still within these lines today um they're often really good at like asking questions of like well why do you believe in god like question like the steps of arguments and things like that um but then the question really comes to like building out your worldview which is what you said, like you could get like maybe past that, like God question. Maybe they'll say like, okay, well, God doesn't exist. There's no good reason to believe in God. But then you have this project where you have to construct a whole worldview, which is a challenge that new atheists seems to be struggling with. And why like people you said, like Peterson and Murray are really like gaining influence. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that's the problem is that once you've told people that God doesn't exist, you still have to give them some kind of credible reason for living. And I don't think the new atheism does has done that. Um, I think it's why you've seen so many people attracted to the speaking of Jordan Peterson, the writing, you know, uh, and so on. I think he was, uh, he, he kind of exploded onto the scene back in 2018, kind of as a father figure to a lot of young men who felt kind of lost and were kind of having an identity crisis of sorts. Um, mm -hmm. And, and and which goes to show that that a lot of the time it's not the intellectual questions of God that are foremost in people's mind. It's it's more the question of who am I? What am I here for? What is my identity? And I think we're living in a kind of um, increasingly in our world a kind of a meaning crisis, especially in the West, because so many of the things that the Christian story that was once kind of taken for granted in the West and was the sort of binding narrative that everyone shared, because that's got lost. It means that people don't know who they are or how they're meant to live or what their identity is. What was once kind of given to them almost by the Christian story that, yes, you've been created by a God, that you're here for a purpose. Um, that's now kind of been taken away. And we live in this culture where you can kind of create your own identity from scratch. But I think that's incredibly difficult, especially for young people. I think it puts them under a tremendous amount of strain and burden and so you've got psychologists now, like John Vivekey, describing, you know, in the absence of a religious framework, this meaning crisis that's sort of engulfed, especially a younger generation. And that's, I think, where a lot of these new thinkers, um, like Peterson and others, what they're speaking into, they've recognized that there is a meaning crisis in our culture. 
they've recognized that Christianity once spoke to that, that uh, and in its absence, we've got to ask what, what we're filling it with. And my argument is simply that the Christian story is there and could well be due to come back again. In fact, uh, what I do in the book is, is tell a number of stories of very unlikely converts who, as adult thinkers, have come to faith because they've realized that they can't be sustained by the thin gruel of atheist materialist secularism, that the, the story that tells is just too thin to be able to sustain someone in any meaningful way. And so so it's been really interesting to trace some of the interesting journeys of people who have decided, actually, no, we need to, um, who, who have who've taken Christianity seriously again, you know, some of the, the very unlikely people, um, because they realized, actually, this is the story that makes sense of, of who I am. Hmm. In what ways do you think Christianity is like still influencing the West? Because if we think about it, like even if people are trying to like totally like disavow Christianity and get like away from it, we're looking at something in the West, like a, a worldview that for the greater part of 2000 years has been like the dominant viewpoint in much of the Western hemisphere. Um, so we're not in the Western hemisphere. I'm sorry. Um, in most of Europe and it's spread to the Americas with Columbus and all that stuff. Um, so in what ways is like Christianity still like a pervasive influence like in the West, even if people may not even like recognize it? I, I think, what again, this is where <clears throat> the work of Tom Holland really come, comes into its own because he, he's demonstrated, along with others, that Christianity has shaped, whether people recognize it or not, the world we live in. Um, so he describes it as being a goldfish swimming in a goldfish bowl, you know, a fish swimming in water doesn't realize that it's swimming in water it doesn't recognize the water around it but we're all actually swimming in christian waters whether or not we realize it or not because if you go back to classical times the greco-roman world there were very different ideas about what it means to be human how you should treat each other slavery was just a given in that world you know up to a third of people in the roman world uh, were slaves and that was the way the economy functioned um, the use of um, uh, prostitutes and uh, and slaves for for sex for sexual gratification by masters was just again a given in that world. There was no sense of consent. There was no sense of some kind of inherent dignity to individuals that needed to be preserved. Um, uh, likewise, there was no sense of um, that that we should be compassionate to the vulnerable. Um, you know, if you were vulnerable, that was just the way it was. Um, all of these things got changed because of Christianity. Christianity was the driving force that changed the way we think about issues like human equality between men and women, um, uh, between different social classes. Um, you know, when Paul wrote, <clears throat> in Christ there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, that was a radically egalitarian statement for its time. We kind of take it, as, as a kind of normative ethics now in the West, but actually that was incredibly different, incredibly unusual. And, and it's only when you realize just how much the Christian worldview, the Christian story has shaped the way we think today, that you come to start to realize that the West itself is a kind of a very unusual thing. Um, the vast majority of cultures historically, and today in other parts of the world, do not run on the principles that so many people in the West take for granted around liberal democracy, equality, human rights, and so on. These are, as Tom Holland would put it, theological inventions. These are things that don't exist if you just, if the world just runs according to the normal principles, uh, according to normal Darwinian mechanisms or whatever. And so, and so I often have conversations with atheists and agnostics where they are just assuming that this is just the, the way that we should think about life, that people have inherent dignity, that we're all equal. And, and I have to remind them, no, that's that's very much a contingent idea that has come to you because of the culture you live in, the Judeo-Christian culture you live in. This this isn't something that you can get from science. That That's not going to tell you that we should treat everybody the same. Uh, it's not something you get by just reasoning. There were lots of very intelligent philosophers in many different cultures who did not come to these conclusions. You know, Plato, you know, believed that slavery was absolutely normal and, uh, you know, a, a, an important part of of any culture so you've got to ask yourself what if you really believe that the west has got something right when it comes to these values where did it come from if it came from christianity maybe we need to ask ourselves whether there's something 
true about Christianity and actually something worth preserving, something perhaps that we even need to go back to, because I'm not sure that we can preserve those values if we cut off the roots. It's that old, you know, adage about can you have the fruits without the roots? And I'm, I'm just not convinced that we can continue to sustain those fruits of Western democracy without Christianity. Mm, yeah, that's super helpful, Justin. And I think even like it's been a few years since I've read like that book, Dominion, Dominion that you're talking about by Tom Holland. But there was a chapter, I believe I'm right, towards the end where he talks about even like when we're looking at like the Me Too movement, how that idea about like uh, people being treated equally and you can't like take advantage of people. Like that's an idea that's rooted in like Christian history. Um, so that'd be interesting for something for viewers to take away is just think about like where are these ideas that you have about like equality? Mm. Um or other things where where are these ideas coming from like they, it's, it's highly unlikely you're the first person to think in the west like that all people are just like should be treated equally um but where does that idea come from and i think that's something that you emphasize really well justin yeah thank you and and ultimately you know where it comes from is page one of the bible you know in the book of genesis it says um that god created humans in his image he created them male and female and and that, in a sense, has stood as the foundation, both in Judaism and then in Christianity, of the idea that humans have inherent dignity and value. Again, even in its own day, you know, um, that was not that was a radical idea in the ancient Near East. This, this was the, these ideas are, are quite unusual. Um, and it was equally still a strange and unusual idea in the first century world that Jesus lived in. Um, and we've only got used to that idea or came to come to take it as, as normative because we are so soaked, as I say, in those Christian waters that we swim in today. And, and we need to understand that we have this gift um, of Christian inheritance, which so many people don't realize. And the question is, can we sustain it in the future um, if we if we continue to move away from the Christian story in the West? Mm, yeah, that's super helpful. So how has the work of Jordan Peterson like been used? Like you describe it like almost like as a gateway drug um, to Christianity for some, drawing especially like young men. Um, I consider myself a young man. I'm 20, about to turn 23. Um, you look so like I've, a very I've, young man to me, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I've, I've heard Peterson, like I remember like when COVID first started, I would drive yeah. DoorDash and I would listen to like Jordan Peterson stuff a lot. Um, like how, like what's he doing? Um, like drawing people towards Christianity? Yeah, Peterson, in some ways, is a really, you know, tricky, interesting, frustrating character because, <laughs> um, as I say, he, he can be quite polarizing. Um, if you look at his social media and uh, some of what he puts out, you know, a lot of it kind of falls into the the quite kind of cultural warrior um, sort of <laughs> side of the equation. But at the same time, he he, I think, brings a lot of nuance to a lot of his writing and thinking when it comes to the way he recognizes the way that the Bible has almost unlimited reserves of psychological power. Um, he really sees the Bible as an extraordinary compendium of literature and wisdom that kind of goes to the heart of the human condition. And, you know, this was a guy who even before he kind of became the household name that he is, at least in, in some quarters today, uh, he he was filling out theatres for lectures on the book of Genesis, you know, and these were not crusty academics who were turning up. This was, you know, as I say, a lot of young people who seemed to be really eager to hear what he had to say. And so what, what's he, you know, he, if you could bottle that and, you know, a church pastor, I'm sure would love to have <laughs> to be able to fill all the seats in their church with young people wanting to hear about the Bible. Um, for whatever reason, Jordan Peterson seemed to be scratching at a niche that a lot of millennials and uh, and Gen Z seemed to have when it came to wanting to go deeper, wanting something more than just a kind of glib rationalistic answer to what life is about that's simply ultimately about neuroscience and chemicals. He, he seemed to want to dig deeper and was willing to kind of almost get very close to saying there's something extraordinary about this world there's something different there's something magical um so much of it you know his his advice was is always in a sense dressed up in the garb of sort of psychology and rationality but but he also seems to teeter on the edge of saying there is a god there is something that you're meant to be here for there's a kind of there's there's a 
a completely different dimension to reality. And in his own personal journey, you know, a lot of Christians have been following with great interest what he has to say about God and Jesus and that kind of thing. He seems at times to to be on the verge of saying you know, or converting to Christianity. And when I had him on my show, uh, you know, I asked him, well, do you believe in God, Jordan? And, and he said that classic line, well, it depends what you mean by God. Um, <laughs> and what, what Jordan Peterson sometimes seems to mean by God is a kind of whatever is the apt at the top of your hierarchy of values, a kind of very Jungian psychological explanation of God. But at other times, he seems to talk about God very conventionally, as though there is a creator, uh, a divine mind behind the universe uh, who intended for, 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 for you to be here. And, and likewise, just on occasion when he's, you know, talking about the character of Jesus, uh, he seems to get very close to saying, yes, this, this strange person seems to pull together both the intellectual moral and imaginative world and and he's yeah he he's he's a fascinating guy because there are obviously so many people listening to him and we all want to see where where that journey takes him mm. one of the things i really appreciate about peterson like is he's inspired me to like read more widely like before like i listened to peterson like i wasn't reading like i would have never had a book like catch 22 by joseph heller or like dostoevsky mm. like crime and, crime and punishment um reading people even like Paulo Freire, who's very not Christian, um, just like reading these people, like that's one thing that like Pearson's inspired me to do is just like, for me as a Christian is like to really read outside these ideas, like these ideas. And you can really see how, one of the things I love about Peterson is like, he can draw like, like here's some similarities, to, like these Christian ideas that you can pull out of like Dostoevsky, or like you can read Joseph Heller and see like his worldview. Um, and just things like that, I think have been super valuable also that Peterson has been doing um, for people. Yeah. And, and as you say, I think that's why he has served to some extent as a gateway to Christianity for some people, because as he's kind of almost spoken about the Bible in serious terms. I think it's allowed people to take Christianity seriously again. And there, I, I, I tell a few stories in the book of people who basically have come to faith because they started following Jordan Peterson. Now, I'm not sure where Jordan Peterson is exactly on on that, but I know that even his you know, close personal family members have become Christians. Um, Michaela Peterson has said that she's sort of had a conversion to Christianity. I know that his wife is now a very devout practicing Catholic. So something's going on there. And and many of his closest friends and the people that he's engaging with most frequently are themselves people of faith as well. So so there's a there's something fascinating going on in that that whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's almost like he's opened up this like whole other world of like apologetics almost or like in the past like i thought about it like oh you had like you're like you had your your column cosmological argument or maybe you're like you're gonna go the swim burn route and we're gonna have this resurrection argument and it's very like fact-based like mm. cold cold not cold in a bad way but like cut and dry and cold yeah. like these logical arguments it's analytical peterson, yeah yeah analytical there you go um and peterson what he's done is he's opened up this whole other way of kind of like viewing like well christianity gives like meaning purpose and you can read like these people again like dostoevsky um and come to like experience and know god and like come to be convinced of christianity in like a whole other way that is like isn't through like these analytical arguments yeah and and it's interesting because i think you know, I've, I've lived and breathed the world of apologetics for a long time and have done so many of those analytical kind of debates, you know, about the Kalam cosmological argument or the argument for morality or, you know, you know, various ways in which you can give, I think, you know, quite valid, strong arguments for theism. But if it doesn't touch the imagination, then I think it does ultimately leave people a bit cold or it's abstract, at least. And and. I think what Peterson does, um, he doesn't he, he he sometimes touches on some of those types of arguments. But really what he does is he engages people's imagination. He wants he gets them to want it to be true, really. And mm -hmm. in that sense, you know, he is quite like a C.S. Lewis character. Now, now, Lewis did both. He did the analytical kind of stuff. You know, he, he did that kind of apolog traditional, quote unquote, apologetics. But arguably, Lewis engaged more people for Christian faith through his Narnia books than he ever did through his apologetics books specifically. And, and for me, that's because Lewis was a master at engaging the imagination as well as engaging the brain. And, and I think that's often what we've failed to do in the church and in apologetics generally, 
is that we we kind of divorce the the left and right side of the brain if you like to to give that crude stereotype of the 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 sort of cold hard rational side of our brain being the left side and the right side being the more imaginative artsy side of our brain and actually it was c.s lewis himself who said that it was in the person of jesus that he managed to bring those two parts of his personality together you know mm. the kind of the logical rational side of himself that was essentially an atheist and the imaginative side where he just loved literature and norse mythology and everything else it was in the person of jesus that he managed to bring those two together he realized that that all of the things he loved in imagination were fulfilled in jesus and that he didn't have to give up the analytical intellectual side of his personality but they both met in this person and i suppose that's my my hope for for, for a jordan peterson is that he'll come to that same kind of lewis type you know moment of revelation uh, but i think for everyone um we need to realize that people are you know complex creatures and mm. you rarely ever s simply bring someone to the edge of faith just through an intellectual argument there's a lot more going on and usually the imagination helping them to want it to be true is is a big part of that hmm. yeah that's very true justin um something you hit it at earlier was this idea of like the meaning crisis um that is facing like a modern secular culture especially that kind of hit like new atheism um one question that is obviously like an important one today is like the mental health crisis. Like how does this meaning crisis uh, relate to like the mental health crisis that we're seeing today? I, I think, I think it's very tied in. So the statistics tell us, don't they, that we are seeing a, a mental health crisis, um, rates of depression, anxiety, suicide among men is higher than it's ever been. Um, and that seems very strange given we live arguably in a more prosperous well-to-do, well-resourced culture than we ever have done. Um, if you read Stephen Pinker, he had this well-known book called The Better Angels of Our Nature and then Enlightenment Now, which told this story of constant progress and constant markers of the ways in which we are improving in all kinds of ways as a culture. And yet, at the same time, we see this marked increase, especially among young people, of depression, anxiety. Um, and for me, there's a number of contributing factors, not least technology, you know, which is forcing us to interact with each other in ways that are very unhuman, actually, um, because mm -hmm. they're divorcing us from kind of normal everyday kind of interactions. And they're forcing us to have an almost endless barrage of information that I don't think our brains are really designed to cope with. So there's that. But in a sense, the technology thing is only accelerating what has already been going on for some time, which is the kind of identity crisis that I think we're facing in the West. And that's that people just don't know who they are or what they're supposed to be because they're being told they can be anything. But when you're told you can be anything, you get kind of paralyzed by the choice. Uh, and it, as I said, it's this kind of intolerable burden, I think, on a lot of young people who feel that they have to create themselves and their identity from scratch, because now there's obviously a whole range of identities that anyone can pick and choose from. But actually, um, most people aren't, we're not really created to, to have that kind of variety or, or choice. Um, we, and, and in fact, the Christian story is one which says you do have an identity. It's an identity that's found in Jesus Christ. And, and, and once you take away that kind of joint identity, that you're part of a kind of big story, you know, that has a, a beginning, a middle and an end, that there is a kind of a reason you were created there's a purpose to your life now and there's going to be a resolution to your story in the end once you take that away from people and you're left basically in a kind of free floating void where you have to make up your own story and in the end <laughs> there isn't really a story to be part of you're just one in a, a number of kind of accidental collocations of atoms to use the the phrase from Bertrand Russell if that's the kind of the background hum of our culture for young people, then it's no surprise to me that we head in nihilistic directions and that young people find themselves having this identity crisis because we've told them basically you, you, you are kind of ultimately meaningless, that, that there isn't any ultimate story mm -hmm. that you're meant to be part of. And for me, that, that has to psychologically have a huge effect when it comes to this meaning crisis that has, you know, been outlined by so many philosophers and psychologists and and for me that's that's 
that's something the church needs to be responding to more more maybe than kind of just you know pointing people to the kalam cosmological argument as brilliant as it mm. is there is this kind of real meaning crisis identity crisis that the church needs to be addressing what i was thinking about like when you were talking justin is like the impact even of social media in a negative way like growing up i remember like my since middle school just like you go on it refreshing instagram and you like all these things and we're seeing mm. so much about like um like you talked about like finding like ultimately like our meaning our identity in jesus and christ and like knowing him and the story that we're a part of but everything it seems like you're not everything but a lot of things on like the outside world want to push you to like oh like look at nicole Jokic who just won the nba championship last night um or things like that like looking at like athletes uh looking at like success or money or love like finding these things is like, Oh, once you see this and like, look, you can see it right here on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, this is what you want right here. And then you're good. Um, mm. And then when people start pursuing those things and not even thinking about like the meaning of like Jesus and Christ and things like that. And I think that's something that isn't, hasn't been addressed a lot, but is really pulling a lot of young people like away oh, from like massively. seeing like, the true yeah. like, meaning. And, and as, as has been well documented, the, the social media networks and sites are designed basically to, trigger the endorphins in your brain they're there to give you that serotonin hit and everything else so that you essentially become addicted to them <clears throat> but the problem with with addiction is that it quickly becomes hollow and you you kind of we're all basically now at the mercy of of these algorithms which are basically very divisive actually they they ca cause people to fall into endless sort of echo chambers basically and secondly, they're incredibly distracting. No one can actually concentrate on anything for more than 30 seconds because we're, we're, we've now trained our brains to kind of need constant, you know, updating and, uh, and new information uh, uh, and experiences. And, uh, and, it, and it leads to, yeah, ab absolutely, that, that sense of validation among, especially among young people that, oh, I'm, I'm only worth anything if my Instagram feed looks like so-and-so. When we all know, in fact, that everyone's social media feed is very highly curated, the lives that people portray on Facebook or Instagram or anywhere else are rarely as as smooth and beautiful as as they appear to be in public. Um, so it's you know it's it's a strange world that we've created for ourselves. And again, I'm just reminded that the more you know, I think there is this this myth still ex it persists among people that. The more technology we have, the more science we have, the more brain power we have, we we will just make ourselves a better world. It, it's just not true. We none of that stuff can actually save us because we're still human deep down. We still have the same mm. sort of selfish um, sort of drives, the same thing. You know, the, the caveman brain that that kind of is looking for that endorphin hit on Facebook is is very similar to what was going on a hundred thousand years ago. And you've got to ask yourself, well, what's what what can save us if it's not technology if it's not science if it's not you know our, our immense brain power uh and i've never found a better answer than the, the christian story because i'm not sure that people are any happier today than they were 500 years ago do you know what i mean then mm -hmm. they've certainly got a lot more uh, you know as as people have pointed out um you know a lot more opportunity in terms of life expectancy uh in terms of health in terms of you know freedom from war and that kind of thing, disease. But I'm not sure anyone's actually happier. Um, and that's because we've kind of created this very alien, weird technological culture that doesn't doesn't fit us right as humans, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just thinking like, like it encourage people like, and I'm doing it right now, personally reflecting, like thinking like, are you happy? And it's like one of the things that like, I think is beautiful about the Christian message message is like kind of like come as you are. It's not like, hey, once you get this, like come join us, or hey, like once you're there, once you get the success or whatever, come join us. The Christian message is like come as you are and like come to like know Jesus and like partake in this story right as you are. Like you are ready and you are capable right now to be a part of mm. God's story. And there's something really yeah. amazing about that. No, I, I I'd agree entirely. And and again, I think it's one of the the messages of our current social media, especially um those parts of culture which could be termed kind of quote unquote more woke there is a a lot of the messaging i think that people receive and young people especially is that you have to live up to a certain set of expectations you have to have the right beliefs 
uh, the right kind of views, the right um, social action and everything else. And most of us, frankly, we're not very good people. and we, We're not that good. <laughs> and we all need grace because we're all very fallen and we all make mistakes. And that's what Christianity says. It accepts you, except it tells you that you're not good enough. And that's the whole point. You know, Jesus came to make up the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we have grace and we have forgiveness. Unfortunately, the, the more kind of... Um, uh the, the 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 identitarian kind of woke kind of forms of culture tend to be quite religious in nature in as much as they expect very high standards and they can be you know very uh, assertive and dogmatic they can you know have their own heretics and their own sort of religious rituals almost but what they all lack is grace. They all lack the idea that people make mistakes and can be forgiven. Um, there's, it's a very, uh, it, 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 yeah, it's, it's a kind of an absolutist kind of religion that you find. And I think the more that that can tend to dominate people's timelines, I, again, I think it creates this, this crisis because you'll never match up. You'll never be good enough <laughs> in this social media mm -hmm. world. Uh, and I'm so glad for Christianity. And I think when people discover Christianity in its true form, where they can simply fall into the arms of a, of a loving, forgiving God, then it is a huge relief. Um, it's, and it's something people still need to hear today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Reading, I, I believe it's Colin Hansen, his new, like kind of like biographical sketch of Tim Keller. Like one of the things he emphasizes with Tim Keller is like, that's one of the messages he really tried to preach in New York city was this message of like grace and Christianity of like, come as you are with your brokenness. Um, and let's lay it at Jesus' feet and you don't have to make yourself perfect or something before you come mm. to Jesus. Like you can kind of just take it as you are today and just lay that in front of him. And there's something really beautiful about that. And, and Tim Keller was brilliant at, identifying the idols of our time you know and those mm. aren't the the wooden and stone idols perhaps that the israelites were were prone to worshiping but we have plenty of idols in the modern world that we tend to put in the place of god essentially and there are the kind of familiar you know pretenders like money sex and power but equally there can be lots of on the face of it good things um you know some special cause a you know a particular political ideology some some justice cause that people can pursue but it can become again an idol it can become idolatry when we make that our our religion if you like and that's what i see happen a lot is in the absence of god people worship something and they tend to worship whatever is you know again to use that jordan peterson-esque language that that high the highest in their hierarchy of values and and if it's some cause or or ideology then that becomes their new sort of totem pole that 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 that, that they have to gather around and um and ultimately uh they never satisfy those those idols are always take more than you ever receive from them uh and and that was what keller was reminding you know those very successful manhattanites that went to his church he was reminding them that you're very high achieving uh the world probably thinks you're doing amazingly but actually um it's all you know n none of it can actually lift you up to god god has to come down and rescue us and and we have to find our identity in jesus ultimately not in those things that we often put in the place of god mm. let's talk about those manhattanites i guess that's a word um thinking about like there's been a, like a large rise in religious nuns and i'm sure a lot of people mm. like including myself can reflect on this and you know a lot of people who maybe they don't identify as an atheist but they're not going to like sign up to like volunteer at like the church bake sale or something like that um what's your take on like the rise of religious nuns that we're seeing in society today yeah I, I think it's well documented um and i think you see it especially at the sharp end of that is among uh sort of gen z and millennials um many many people and we're talking about nuns n-o-n-e-s here aren't we which is just people who say <laughs> when when the survey comes around that they have no religious affiliation um what's interesting is when you actually dig into those surveys, you might think, oh, well, the new atheism, you know, it really had a profound effect. Uh, they really got their evangelism going. But actually, very few of those nuns actually identify as strict materialists, as atheists, per se. Um, they tend to be agnostic at best. And I think a lot of them actually end up kind of ticking a box that's something more like spiritual but not religious. I think there's a still a lot of spiritual but not religious people 
hanging around. And, and when you again dig into the into some of these surveys and polls, you find that a number of people who tick the none box still pray fairly regularly. Um, a, a number of them, you know, still have some kind of quasi religious rituals or um, sentiments. Um, and and for me, what that suggests is that religion hasn't gone away per se. We haven't become non religious. We've just become religious about different things. As I say, I think we've become very religious about certain social justice issues in our day. I think we've become very religious about politics. I think we've become very religious. Some people get very religious about sports or whatever it is, Some something, uh, and, and it's just being channeled into different places. And I think there's still a kind of a general kind of vague spirituality that still washes around for a lot of people. Um, I saw it, for instance, when um, I walked along the huge queue that developed to go into Westminster um, to the Houses of Parliament where the Queen's body was lying in state at the time of her death last year. And it was a very extraordinary thing to see hundreds of thousands of people lining the streets of London in this very orderly queue. You can't get anything more British really than a, a very long queue. But they were there wanting to pay their respects to Queen Elizabeth, who of course had, you know, been the queen for over 70 years highly regarded and significant person and i could imagine that the vast majority of those people would have called themselves nuns if they'd been asked they they i'm sure they don't go to church but it's notable that in that week probably there was a huge upsurge in the number of people who did enter a church building to potentially sign a book of condolence to say a prayer they wanted to do something to recognize the momentous moment that we were living through. And likewise, when people kindly got to that coffin after waiting for hours and hours for their moment to come, they were often searching for some kind of a sign, something to, to mark the dignity of this moment, maybe crossing themselves or putting their hands together or, or something. And, and it reminded me that people, there's still a kind of undercurrent of religious sentiment. There's still a kind of people want to, they want to get the meaning out of those moments. And it's very hard to do that in a completely secular culture. Um, when people have forgotten the rituals, actually, where that Christianity gave them to do that, I, I think people are still searching for something. And so I wonder whether it, whether it's going to be that much. You know, you, you never know how easy it might be, actually, once the conditions are right, for people to suddenly realize that they've been looking for that all along. Um so I don't I don't get too worried about the the, the polls about the nuns. I think um, I think you know people's opinions on that sort of stuff ebb and flow, but we're all there's still an undercurrent of of uh, what's the word divine sort of thinking beneath mm -hmm. it all. I just don't think that goes away. I don't think people's innate religiosity actually goes away, no matter what they tick on the on on the polls. There's a lot of people I know like in my own personal life people i've known for years that maybe have like left the church and left like organized religion but most of those people i know would still have like like what you said justin is like this innate religiosity where there mm. is like still like a belief in like god or or some sort of like spiritual force um so i mean you may take away the religion like the organized christianity but there still is like you said like this innate like belief in something like bigger than themselves that's still there so yeah Exactly. And and I think that the key for the Christian church is to recognize that that's still there um, and to help people see the way in which Christianity is actually the better story, the best story of all the stories that people tell themselves and the way in which those small stories people tell themselves, um, the other things they try to fill their lives with religiously won't ultimately save them, won't ultimately, you know, um, it give them the identity that they're looking for. And for me, um, we're living in this moment where I think the church could step up. The church has a, an enormous opportunity because I think people have kind of reached the end of their resources when it comes to the atheist materialist story of reality. And one of the, uh, well, the, the main kind of metaphor that I use in the book and um, on the front cover, it's kind of got a wave coming in um, to a shoreline mm -hmm. um, is the idea that, the so-called sea of faith, which um, the, the Victorian poet Matthew Arnold said was going out in his generation. He wrote a famous poem called Dover Beach in which he described the uh, 
uh, melancholy, long withdrawing roar of the sea of faith. Um, I think that sea of faith, which was going out even in the Victorian age and has only intensified since, I think we might be seeing the sea of faith reaching its furthest point. And it was Douglas Murray, a well-known atheist uh, journalist and thinker here in the UK, who in a conversation with me and N.T. Wright, it was when he said, well, the point about tides, referencing that poem by Matthew Arnold, he said, that's the point about tides. They come back in again. And I thought, you know what, maybe we are due to see the tide come back in again on faith because people can only live with the, as I say, that thin story of secular materialism for so long. If it doesn't end up answering their questions, their deepest purposes, their longings, if it isn't actually an answer to the meaning crisis or the identity crisis, then maybe the time will come when they will be ready to listen to the Christian story again. The story mm. that actually has, whether they like it or not, a deep resonance and shaped them more than likely. Um, and so I, that's my kind of contention that we may yet see the rebirth of belief in God, this tide of faith coming back in again in our generation. Hmm. what is like one of your favorite stories justin of like as we've seen like where you think like maybe like the tide like is coming back um of maybe like an unexpected conversion to like christianity well one of the stories i tell right at the end is is um paul kingsnorth story uh and paul kingsnorth is a celebrated author and poet um he went through a phase of teenage atheism um he's a uh and 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 but went on all kinds of interesting journeys He's well known as well for his work in ecology as an environmentalist and an, as an activist at one time. Um, but he also had this sense that he wanted to worship something. Uh, he spent some time in Zen Buddhism, even went off into Wicca as well um, to sort of do nature worship, but ultimately found that none of that really satisfied. And um, he said he was the last person he ever expected this to happen to, but he became a Christian. And this was uh, only a few years ago. So uh, I think he's, I think Paul's into his 50s now. So he's certainly a, a, a late convert to Christianity. But Paul, I think what Paul saw was that um, in all of his writing and all of his activism, he discovered that humans cannot save themselves. Um, he, he became very disillusioned, actually, with the environmental movement that he'd been part of because he saw it as just basically people trying to save themselves and save the world, but without really addressing the state of who they are deep down. He And he describes the technological and ecological crisis as ultimately a spiritual crisis. And he realized, um, and he had a very powerful experience in which it suddenly became apparent to him that what he'd really been looking for all along was the last thing he thought he'd be looking for, which was the Christian story. And so he had a, a very profound conversion to um, Eastern Orthodox Christianity and continues to write and speak very powerfully on that subject. So Paul Kingsnorth is just one of those unlikely converts um, who I speak about in the book, people who I think represent this incoming wave of spiritual seekers, thinkers, people who for whom the atheist materialist story, that narrative just doesn't make sense doesn't make sense of the bigger picture of what life is about and and yeah he uh I, I love the way he talks about the fact that he was ultimately dragged out of wicca he he really recognizes the spiritual dimension to life uh now that he's a christian and and he's very open about it and um and i think if it could happen to paul king's north i think it could could happen to anyone really mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super cool. Praise the Lord for that. Um, how do you think, Justin, like the church can like prepare to receive and care for people like this? Um, people who are like newly cu curious about like Christianity and the faith. Well, I give I give three particular sort of points at the end of the book, ways in which I think the church can can be ready if there is going to be a an incoming tide of, if you like, refugees from the, the meaning crisis. Um, I think, first of all, the church needs to engage both reason and imagination. And I think as we were talking about earlier on in our conversation, sometimes the church has done one at the expense of the other, but I think we need both. I think we need good apologetics. I think we need people who can make the case for God cogently and coherently. And, and I'm so pleased that in a way, the unexpected result of that, that new atheist movement was actually that it woke the church up to its intellectual heritage 
And mm. we see some amazing, you know, apologetics ministries come out of that, including your own. And for, for me, that's really important. But let's not forget that actually people are just as much um, fired by the imagination as the way they, they kind of want the world to be. <laughs> you see that in all the, the superhero, you know, movies that, that are blockbusters. You see it in the way people love the Lord of the Rings and things like that. People want there to be, they want the story to be enchanted, essentially. And we can remind them that actually it is enchanted. Mm. So for me, that's important. Apologetics and imagination. I think we also need to be ready as a church to be kind of open to diversity and open to the fact that people are going to be in lots of different places when they come through the doors, uh, when they start to investigate. And we need to be open to their questions. Uh, we need to be have a way of engaging people so that what they find in the church is not just a kind of a one dimensional kind of only a certain type of person is allowed through our doors. The kind of thing that they do find in the culture where, you know, we're in, living in increasingly polarized times where you have to be the left or right or progressive or conservative or whatever it is that the church can cope with lots of different people. Um, we have obviously a truth to proclaim, uh, but that we can make space for doubters, for seekers, for questioners, for people who are, you know, um, maybe have been bruised by church as well by their previous expressions of church but I think also in doing that we need to remember that as as a, as a number of people said to me as I was re reading and researching and interviewing people for this book that we need to keep Christianity weird um, we shouldn't try to be too much like the culture in that sense I think what a lot of people are looking for in church is something different to the culture they're not just looking for a souped up version of you know, the Coldplay concert, you know, uh, 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 they're not looking for um, just the church to be yet another mouthpiece of a sort of politically correct culture. They want something that's kind of unique and different. Um, Tom Holland says this repeatedly to me when I have conversations with him that that what attracts him to church, you know, is is it's is it's kind of more um, ancient, alien almost sensibilities. The fact that you can step into maybe in his case, a very old church and feel connected with something that goes back millennia. It doesn't just mm. feel five minutes old. And, and again, Douglas Murray said something very similar. He, he, he wants the church to sort of major on, he wants Christianity to stay weird. Basically he, if it's just another sort of version of secular culture around us, then it won't have any appeal to people like him because it'll feel like just another another thing so I, I think there's maybe a few things for the church to think about as it starts to to think about how it could welcome people who are maybe yeah refugees from the meaning crisis mm. yeah even thinking again like going back to tim keller in that book um one thing that keller talked about like with like revival is the idea that like if we want like this new wave or like the tide to rescind um how are we looking at it uh tim keller thought revival happened when your heart and your head come together it's like when you have like this like good theology and maybe good apologetics and like you have this like good like precise like thing that you can put into people's minds it's like hey like wrestle with this and like here's our doctrine but then also having like this heart of like hey this will give you meaning this will give you purpose um things like that and when the two come together that's when revival happens at least that's what keller thought it seems yeah i, I think that's right I, I think it goes back to that first point about the the reason and the imagination when when they come together it can be very powerful um, and again, I've seen that happen for so many people. I, I mean, another story I tell in the book is of Holly Ordway, who I've interviewed a couple of times, who um, was a grew up really loving the Narnia stories, the Lord of the Rings, fantasy literature, poetry. But she grew up in a, a non-Christian household. She had no real reason to, you know, even think about Christianity, I think. And by the time she got to university, she was you know, essentially an atheist, but she was headed in, in an academic direction of being, an, um, you know, a um, uh, of, of looking at English literature, of researching, and 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 she eventually, when she started teaching literature and poetry, she realised that all of the stories and the poetry that she loved best had christian origins essentially they were being written by christians it was christian poets that most fired her imagination people like john dunn and gerard manley hopkins and others and she began to wonder why is that um 
And that was the spark that led her on a journey to investigating Christianity. Now, she had to, in the course of doing that, check it out intellectually. She, she was only willing to kind of take it seriously once she'd been shown that there was a kind of credible case, for instance, for the resurrection. But at the same time, it was because it gave her the permission to believe that the things that she found most valuable in the same way that C.S. Lewis did in poetry, in literature, in her imaginative side of her, that the fact that that was actually not just, I don't know, chemicals firing in her brain, but that there was a real something that that related to, that there was a real magical <laughs> universe that she lived in, in that sense. Um, that, that, was what really sealed the deal for her. That's what brought her over the line. And she realized she could step into this same world as the Christian poets and writers that she so loved. Uh, she realized that it wasn't just an illusion, that there was a reality to, to that imaginative world. And it was it found its center in Jesus Christ. And so for me, again, that's just another story of the way in which the intellect and the imagination have to come together in that way. Mm. Um, one more question, Justin, and we'll start to wrap up. Um, if someone's talking to like a newly curious non-Christian, like we've been talking about a lot today, uh, what are some good questions to ask them about their thoughts and their experience? Um, if, if, if you're talking to someone who, you know, is maybe at the very beginning of their faith journey, I, I think you can certainly ask them um, just to consider what I mean what 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 means most to them in life you know i think that's a good place to begin um and hopefully you can start a conversation in which you can you can point to the ways in which the christian story speaks to their deepest desires and longings uh the way in which um nothing is off limits in christianity that that you know every story can find its home in jesus christ um you'd also want to point them towards you know stuff like your show and you know if they're a kind of an intellectually engaged kind of person someone who wants to kind of have those kinds of answers there's so many great resources out there at our fingertips people that we can point them in the direction of who who have answers to tough questions who help them to think through those kinds of issues um ultimately you know i i would want to point them back to a deep engagement with scripture because so much of what we do say and think in this world is actually inspired by the bible and i think it's so sad in some ways that we've lost connection with it. Even many Christians, you know, have lost connection with a deep understanding of the Bible. And there's some, again, some really great resources out there to help people to connect again with that sort of story that has framed most people's reality, whether they realize it or not in the West. So the, those are just a few places that you could start off kind of helping people to, to go on that journey. Mm, yeah. Well, it's awesome. Thank you, Justin. Um, as we wrap up, two questions one like how can people like follow you connect with you things like that and two like what like what you have this book published what projects are you working on as this book is getting released coming up in september i believe well thank you very much for for, for having me on the show yeah you can follow me uh, in a whole variety of ways um justinbriley.com is my website and you can also uh, get access to uh, signed copies of the book from there um pre-release copies and that kind of thing uh, it's a good place to go um, also, by I think the time this this interview airs, I'll, I'll have been starting a, a special podcast of the same name, The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. So that's mm -hmm. another way to kind of key in on the story of the book as well. If you enjoy listening to podcasts, do go and check out The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. Um, and on social media, you can follow me in lots of different ways. Justin.Briley over on Instagram, um, at uh, JustBriley on uh, Twitter um and there's there's loads of other ways to to keep in touch but justinbriley.com has has uh links to all of them uh so i'm pretty busy just you know talking about this book for now i think um and and as i've said my big project is actually creating a podcast documentary series based on the book as well telling the story of the rise and fall of new atheism and the way in which these new generation of secular thinkers are pointing people back towards christianity again so i'm really excited about that uh, and again, if you want to follow that, um, uh, you can do it from the website, justinbriley.com. You can get hold of the book from there, The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. Uh, you can support the work as well. I've got a Patreon account and all that kind of thing. So anyone will be willing to to get on board and uh, and join in. Yeah, well, Justin, that's awesome. And I can't wait to like listen to this podcast and see what you continue to do as you pursue a very important 
project. So that's awesome. Um, we'll leave link down links down below where you can follow Justin. Um, we'll also leave a link to his book. Again, it's right here. We got the surprising rebirth of belief in God coming out in September, I believe, of 2023. Um, and yeah, that's that. Justin, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thank you everyone for listening today. I hope you found this edifying and valuable. Uh, if you value this show and what we're doing, please subscribe, leave a like, all that fun stuff, share with all your friends. Um, if you value what you do, please consider a, becoming a patron at patreon.com slash adhering apologetics. Justin, I'm too excited for what you're doing. That's why I was talking so fast. Um, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate you and your time and what you're doing. Well, I appreciate you, Zach, and, and well done for all you're doing through adherent apologetics. I really enjoyed the show. Thank you. Well, have a good one, everyone, and God bless. We'll catch you later.